here. So, hi, this is Tiffany Fontenot from We Are Here Lit, and today we are talking to Dawood Aniabwile, um, the Emmy Award winning illustrator, um, also um, the illustrator of many um, noted uh, young adult in children's literature titles such as Monster, Crossover, Booked, um, Becoming Muhammad Ali, and also with his brother, um, the Duke Denham novel. So we're here today to talk to him about uh, visual literacy. So thank you for being with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. So the first thing I wanted to do, because we usually talk about literacy starting from the beginning. So what was your experiences as a reader growing up? Um, well, when I was young, you know, I used to, well, when I first started, I think I was reading more like, uh, children's books, comic books, uh, and like Mad Magazine, because my oldest brother, he used to collect those, so those were pretty funny, uh, so I used to sneak in his collection and read that, um, and then when I started reading, like, I guess more like uh novels i think the first one i read was native son richard wright native son and after that i got turned on to black boy uh by richard wright and um and then also like between that like i guess being an artist also like reading art books you know how to how to draw animals by jack ham was one of my favorites like how to draw comics the marvel way you know just other like anatomy books and things like that but basically <laughs> reading in general that was always encouraged you know and we spent a lot of time in the library after school me and my so um would you, how would you describe yourself as a leader reader were you a good reader did you have difficulties reading or how would you describe uh, <clears throat> it wasn't difficult for me really to read because actually i remember in like third, fourth grade, like winning, well, spelling bee competitions, you know, so I can get the candy, because the candy would be the prize. <laughs> I, want to, I want to get the words right so I can get that Hershey bar. <laughs> and then, uh, but, you know, I guess, I don't know, I, for me, I, I didn't have a problem reading. I think when I started getting older, like seventh, eighth grade, I think I had reading comprehension problems because when I when I was reading certain books, I just didn't understand it. Like, wait, wait what, what's going on? I, I just don't get it, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that would probably be more like social studies books, you know, things that you're doing in school. They weren't really books. Maybe I had an interest in, but I had to do it to do like history lessons and stuff. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's because I wasn't really digging the content. That's why it was important when I got Native Son. Like when my dad gave me that book, um, you know, it just seemed like uh, it's, it was an exciting read. Like I wanted to know what happened next. So I comprehended that book. Yes. Could, could so, you relate to it in any way? Yeah, I could relate to it because it was Black characters. They weren't living the life I was living. You know, he was living more of a hard, uh, rough life, you know, that the story was based on. But it was like action and adventure with Black characters, yeah. you know, and it just seemed um, interesting to me. But it wasn't only just having Black characters, having things that were, like, exciting. Because during that time, like, 77, that's when Star Wars came out. That was, like, a, a big influence on me. So I remember I was in a bookstore, <clears throat> and there was a book called Splinter of the Mind's Eye, which was, like, a spinoff from Star Wars, but it was a novel. It, you know, it was kind of, like, it was from that Star Wars universe. They do a lot of that now, but back then that was probably like rare to see. And I was like, oh, this is from the Star Wars universe. And I remember reading that book, like mm. sitting down every day after school and I said, I got to get through this. <laughs> you know? um, so things that kind of stimulated my uh, imagination from different perspectives. It wasn't always just because it was something black. Sometimes it's just something exciting, something riveting. Um, you know, like an action adventure. Um, Cause that's kind of like what I was into. Yeah. Can can you explain for people? Cause I think this was interesting that I learned when I talked to your brother that y'all had a, like a highly creative environment. P 
period. You know what I mean? Like, um, y'all were making films and th and things like y'all were Spielberging it in Philly. You know, like how yeah. can you explain some of the things y'all would do? Um, let me see. That started, like I said, I like I got into comics like in third grade. You know, that was like one aspect of creativity. Um, my oldest brother, Michael, he 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 since passed away in 2010. But he, um, so when I think when I was in like first grade, I think he's in like eighth grade, and he started with stop motion animation. Like he 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 would lay out this long felt black felt and cut out every little star, and then created these little spaceships. And he had a whole movie about these um, aliens coming to Earth. The story was called the Beatron Beast from Anatrox. I remember that. And all the kids used to come over and watch it. And it looks like the way South Park looks now, but mm -hmm. he did it by hand. And and I think, you know, if we still had it, I think it will hold up to like some really cool animation like people see now. Um, and and I used to want to draw like him too. But he was more like left brain, mathematical. He went to, on to become an engineer uh skydiving mountain climbing all that stuff so he's really adventurous so he left philly like after high school <clears throat> he graduated central then he went to howard and then <clears throat> rice university and then out to the west coast and uh was a mechanical engineer mm -hmm. so what he left on me and my other brother jason um was you know stop motion us wanting to do stop motion so we were doing our own because we we're all into those Sinbad movies, Jason the Argonauts, yeah. all the great Harry Halsen, um stop motion. Matter of fact, hold up. This character right here, mm -hmm. he starred in our movies. This is the actual character. That's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, me and my brother designed, like, we want our own character. So this is like 1980. That's 70. a bicycle chain, right? Is that a no, bicycle? No, no, no. This is these are ball bearings, okay. screws, and metal metal okay. Uh, strips. Okay, I see it now. Okay, and my brother Jason, like, cause me and him are a year apart. Mm -hmm. So he actually built the armature. Wow. See the the mouth moves, <laughs> the arms because you just move them little by little. I see it now. You know okay. Yes. So, but this is the bones, and then I created the. Um, the cast, I sculpted the creature because this was a creature that starred in our movies. Mm -hmm. But this is all that's left of them. So you see all the little orange, yeah. little orange bits. That's the leftover from the foam latex. Foam latex, because <clears throat> we had a book called Fantastic Films. Okay, so here we go, the, the books. Mm -hmm. So basically, back then we didn't have YouTube and stuff. So how do you know how to make a stop motion movie? Right. And growing up in Philly, also, he, I remember Jason said he he was walking around with this when he was older at Temple University, but he had the whole character. It wasn't the bones mm -hmm. that he was walking by these dudes that were standing around. They said, yo, my man got a doll. And he said, man, it's not a doll, man. This is like, you know what it took to make this? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with like, cause you're, you're, you're so far ahead in terms, like now a lot of people, they would get it. They would get science fiction. They would get, um, techniques and all this advanced stuff because of technology and tutorials. But back then when you're trying to figure things out, we were looking in the back of these magazines, like Fantastic Films, um, Cine Fantastic, I think that's what the other one was. And they would show like little shortcuts, how to make somebody beam down, like they're from the Enterprise on Super 8 mm -hmm. and things like that. So with this, like I was saying, that orange stuff, after you make your clay character, you have to make the cast of it. And then when you make the cast out of plaster of Paris, you pour in um, the foam latex. And we had to order that from Los Angeles. And then you have to bake it. So I remember uh, my brother Jason baked it in the oven so we can get the final cast of it. And it stinks. It smells really bad. And my mom was like, what y'all got? Y'all got in the oven. Get that thing out of here. And we was like, like, mom, like this is greatness you got going on here. <laughs> You know what I mean? So then, yeah, I wish I had the whole thing because then you could see the whole monster. Yeah, you know? I see it now. 
if this so was all that was left up, it? so I mounted it here and I, I keep it for keepsake. How old were y'all about? Like 14, 13, yeah. 14. Yeah, and y'all were already like making movies and things like that. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we do those like in our in our bedroom, sometimes on the bed. You know, we would go to the hobby shop and get like the little trees and little houses and um, we would make like a terrain so then this character can walk on it. And then we learned how to do a uh, double exposure. So then it looks like the monster is walking in the bushes, but that's because you get a bush and then you overlay it on top and he's walking behind it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it looked like an old B movie, but all the kids, <laughs> they, would, they, would, they would come to our house to like, to see things like that, mm -hmm. you know? So how old were you when you knew you could draw? Oh, um, well, it's hard to say like, no, I can draw or like to draw. Mm -hmm. Because to me, I was drawing, like I enjoyed drawing since uh, kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, well, like finger painting and stuff like that. And like I said, when my oldest brother was drawing characters, I would um, try to copy what he did when he was drawing monsters and things like that. And then I got into drawing like spaceships and wolves and um, Frankenstein, things like that. And, um, and then by third grade, I started making like my own comic books. And, and um, it just kind of evolved. So I always knew I wanted to do art. Mm -hmm. And I never really saw myself as like a best artist. Even to this day, I don't I don't make those claims. I just try to do my best at what I do to get better for myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then when I got to high school, I went to um, Central. And then when I was there, like uh, the art teacher was uh, Bernard Harmon. And he was like the one of the top art teachers in the city. And he actually went on to like create the art programs for all of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. the, the Philadelphia public school system. Mm -hmm. So that was one reason why I went to Central because uh, my mom was saying, hey, they're winning all the awards. You need to go study under Mr. Harmon. And, you know, personally me, I went to go to like Germantown or something. I said, there's no, no girls there, you know. <laughs> but I had to sacrifice for the art. Yeah. So, you gotta do that sometimes. <laughs> that, was my, that was my journey. So can you um talk about um because you how did growing up in Philadelphia influence your art? Do you think? Um. Oh, a lot. Um. I think initially, like I would say, before high school, a lot of my art was more home based influence like you know the things that my father was teaching in terms of like you know black consciousness and mm -hmm. um he wrote books on the black family um like fa black name his company is black family rituals so he focused more on um us having ceremony and holding families together because of of the things that he experienced growing up and uh and he was very active in the community and things like that. And my mom was an educator in the Philadelphia public school system. So, and she was a musician. So she played the piano. I used to lay under the piano while she played, played the keys and stuff like that. Um, and that was a big influence on me. And me and her would actually, she actually got me into connecting music with visuals. Mm -hmm. So she would play like, orchestra music or cinematic themes and ask me like hey what do you see and I'll explain and she'll say draw it you know mm -hmm. and so you know like as you see now I like I still do music I used to DJ all that stuff but a lot of that came the principles and foundation came out of the home and then when I got into DJing and stuff in high school and that was also like the evolution of hip-hop like Lady B show started kicking coming coming out and stuff like that and Philly was pioneering a lot of that like a lot of people don't realize a lot I met DJ Red Alert because uh, I know his niece and I sat down with him and he was saying how he segued into hip-hop through Philly by mm -hmm. um experiencing the Lady B show and then he got the, the DJ Red Alert show I wouldn't have known that but, mm -hmm. I, but Philly was influential like that because it was all in the street. The vibe was there. The graffiti was there. You know, when I was in high school, 
you know, the dudes in high school and they're writers and stuff like that. And I'm sitting down with them and they showing me the hand styles and all that. So then when I go out in the street, I see, I, I could see it, I could code it. I understand like the difference between the Philly style and the New York style. Cause all my family was from Jersey city. So we were always back and forth between Philly and New York. Mm -hmm. um, so hip hop had a big influence during that time. And even though I was into DJing and hip hop and then I got into airbrushing t-shirts like in 83, 84. So I was pioneering that in Philly. Like people weren't really doing it then. I started doing that because I had a spot at the gallery mall. Mm -hmm. And uh, the brother who gave me that, that opportunity to do that, it put me in front of all these kids where I could actually refine my skill painting and drawing these kids every day and making money, you know, and that that helped me to see like where I stand. So even though I'm getting immersed in this culture, I still had a connection to black family rituals and what my dad was teaching. So I always had to distinguish, or my thing was, hey, why don't we take the energy from this and connect it to our culture, connect, I mean, it is our culture, but it, it gets to the point where it, it can be uh, destructive, but it's a power. I look at it, it's a power. It, it could be destructive or it could be creative or it can drive us further into something great. Mm -hmm. So like when you look at like groups like Public Enemy, Poor Righteous Teachers, I feel like they were an example of what I was, what I was thinking of artistically. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like they took the art form, but then they were advancing things that, that were making young black kids like think more positive about themselves, not, not be uh, careless. And um, yeah. so I said, that's, that's what I want to be, which, you know, but it's an evolution. So it takes time for you to really uh, establish who you are. Was it difficult for you to be, you got to think freely. You had a foundation in black consciousness. You got to be creative, right? Was that hard to be in that space doing that as, as everybody else is just kind of like conform, but you you're our y'all are already in that creative space you know well I'd say sometimes off and on like because the reason why it didn't crush me is because I had the foundation at home and because I had the foundation at home that's what drove most of my uh influence now when you get out there among okay it's one thing when you're among your friends and they clown you or something like that because you like science fiction, you like comics. But at the same time, they kind of dig it. They kind of respect it because they're around you and they're seeing it like, they're seeing it evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I wasn't really into sports. I, I couldn't care less about sports. Uh, I always say, hey, when we start owning teams that's when I'll be interested. Like that's how my mind state was, mm -hmm. you know? But I was more into like, like when my friends would get together to watch basketball I'd be like, man, I'm gonna watch a movie. I wanna see something creative. I wanna see something like story based, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so they usually that's usually where the the uh, disconnect will come with peers, because sometimes I did feel like I'm not a a regular black boy because I'm not doing black boy things, you know. Black boys ain't into science fiction because this is like seventies into the eighties. Nobody was talking about that. Nobody was talking about comic books <clears throat> and all that stuff. Or if you did, you were corny, you know. Mm -hmm. And so. But I had to know within me, I said, I don't think it's corny. I think this is, this is cool. I said, we're always like, we're always, um, we're always living through other people's dreams and fantasies. Why can't we create our own? Yeah. And then when I started, you know, um, getting into like the airbrushing, now I'm dealing with kids from all over the city. And then you talk about like, that's that drug era and stuff like that, where you know, some dudes want me to make drug shirts and things like that. And I had to make that decision to say, yo, I don't, I don't do that. Wow. And, and I've had, I did, you know, I talk about scenario where um, a brother thought him flashing money in front of me would make me want to do a drug shirt, a shirt that promoted drugs. And I said, nah, man, you know, um, cause I was thinking like what my dad, you know, what my dad was teaching. I was like, nah, I can't do that, man. I said, you know, this, it's a family, you know, I do family stuff. And then, but, see, but I also knew I was taking a chance because 
at this point, I'm not at the gallery. This is like my own shop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you don't know what, like some of these guys, they don't want to be told no. And, and you're, you're dealing with this era where they're into stuff. I'm not into that. I'm not living that world. So I got to make a choice. Like, man, do I fold and give him what he wants to uh, avoid whatever this guy, I mean, you know, he might be strapped or whatever. I don't know. But on the flip side, do I disappoint my dad and my mom? They put me in all these art classes and they believe in me. And, you know, it's like, we got to do, do these things. So I was like, <clears throat> so I remember in this one situation, I told the brother, I said, wait, how about I do this? And then I drew him just holding money. You know, it looked like him. He had the, like the sheepskin hat on <laughs> and gazelles and all that stuff. And he went crazy. He said, yo, oh, that's it. That's it. That's me. That's me. And then he still paid me the money. And then he told all his friends and came back. And then we became cool. And then I remember the guy that was in the store with me. He said, man, did you just see what happened? And I said, yup. I said, really, a lot of these dudes come in. It's like they're coming in and they want you to create what they know. Mm. Hey, I'm showing them an aspect, another thing that they probably haven't thought about. And then they realize like they... They, it's like you're directing them into how about we do this without, I don't try to tell him what to do with his life because I didn't live his life. I know, okay, he likes money. He likes this and that. So let me show him with the ends, but I'm not showing the means to the ends. So that way you got your thing. I didn't go against what I feel like I'm trying to push. And it was a cool looking shirt in the end. You know what I mean? And then, then he brought his friends in and we became cool. You know what I mean? And then that's kind of how I built my reputation. This is years before Brother Man. This is yeah. when we came out with the comic. That's why when people ask us, did you know the comic was going to do this? I say, yeah, because mm. I know how my folks are. It's like, if it's like that in Philly and it's like that in Jersey, it's going to be like that in LA and all over the city, all over the country. A lot of times we need to see ourselves. And that was in an era where if you did go to the t-shirt stores, our our image was Warner Brothers characters, you know, Black Bart Simpson, you know, like rehashes of other people. And I was I was putting you on a shirt as you are right now. And that people see that all the time now, Instagram and all that. But people do acknowledge that Brother Man was key to shifting that paradigm during that time. Mm, most definitely. So when you look back at your like, who are your artistic role models? Who did you see and was like, I... I want my, I like the style. I could take this from here, this from here. And this is gonna, this is, this is me. Or this oh, um, me figure out, this helped me figure out me. Uh, okay, that was kind of like an interesting journey. Um, I would say by the time I hit like seventh, eighth grade, um, it was, Mark Drucker from Mad Magazine, he did like a lot of the satire in the beginning of Mad Magazine. I liked his stuff because it was like loose and gestural. And because even though I had like the Marvel comics and stuff, it's because I burned my comics. That's a whole nother story right there. In yeah. seven, in I think grade. I got part of that from your, your brother was telling a part of that story. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a whole nother story um, where, I mean, you know, it did have, you know, and I'll tell other kids to do it. It's just what I was going through during that era and that period of time and how I felt, mm. you know? So, but Marvel did have a grip on me. It had a grip on my mind. And that's what Burning Them did. It got the grip off my mind, mm. you know what I mean? But I still respected it. I still liked it. I still like comics, but I just didn't want to do what they were doing. Um, and then uh, Overton Lloyd, who did uh, Parliament Funkadelics, he does, he does the artwork for Sir Knows Devoid of Funk. And when the uh, album Flashlight came out, it had uh, the comic book inside. And I remember my friend Kevin up the street had the comic. And that blew my mind. I was like, oh, man, because it looked like it had that Mad Magazine type look. But it was like funky. You know, the characters look black. And, you know, George Clinton, he'd be on something else. I never really understood the story. So to me, it was just the visuals. It really wasn't about a story. It was, well, I don't know. Maybe it did. But I'm just saying, for me, it was just the visuals. It was just cool. And then it had a soundtrack. It had Funkadelic's soundtrack. So to I me, mean, but Brother Man is like that, right? But like, see, right. But see, this this is me like, 
I think 13 years old. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But then it's not like I said, hey, I'm trying to recreate this. This was kind of an inspiration. And then, um, and like I said, I, I was a fine arts major all through high school. I still like comics. I still like science fiction. I like hip hop. I like graffiti and all that stuff. And then Brother Man was a, in 1990 was a convergence of all that stuff. The family mm -hmm. had the family aspect. It had the, the inner city aspect. It had the, the principal aspect um it, you know the funky type stuff and it. it was like all the things that i really wanted to see oh and, and also brother man is a mythology like some people they think it's philadelphia or new york i said no it's a it's an alternate universe right a lot of people they didn't get that they thought I, well, how did you come up with the fact that like i want to detach i want people to not you know say like you know, like, are the origins from Africa or this is Philly or New York? How did you just come up with this space? Like, no, this is something totally different and it's futuristic because it's hard. It's been hard for Black people to think us pro proactively or future oriented. So how did you get to that space? Yeah, like now everybody's talking Afrofuturism and all that stuff. And it's like, that wasn't the influence, like, you know, because this, this was before... People were even talking Afrofuturism. People weren't even talking Black comics. And when, um, even prior to Brother Man, me and Guy were doing different types. Actually, Guy was doing certain things. We weren't always like teamed up in our creativity all the time, especially before Brother Man. Guy had stories he wrote. He wrote plays, poetry, love stories, all that. And I was in my world uh, doing my thing. And then if we teamed up on something, we were just we were just there. We we get it, mm -hmm. but. To me, on my end, I had other stories since 85. A lot of stuff going on now, I had stories in 85 that were about the, the there's it's a cashless society and people living off of credits. It becomes overpopulated, um, you know, things like that. Like, uh, you know, cause they were kind of rooted in those science fiction type mode. But then I said, well, how about if it takes place here? And even that movie, um, oh man, that uh, what's Elysium, uh, where where every the the corporations or whatever they went into space. They had space stations and they orbited around Earth, but that's where all the rich people were. They were in space. And I remember my friend hit me up and said, "Man, that was just like that story you had." I know when I saw Elysium, I was like, "Man, I feel like they looked in my sketchbook." But you know, I can't make no claims on anything. But that's what my head was at back then where I had stories where one corporation ran everything. Mm. And, and th this corporation, everybody is wearing the merchandise of that corporation. So it's almost like we're the slaves of that corporation. And, um, but to me, that was a play off of, man, everybody's wearing Adidas, everybody's wearing Converse, where everybody's wearing this. Because when I was airbrushing at the mall, I. Every, you know, everybody's coming up and they were all like, you know, hey, can you, you had me wearing um, uh, troops, had me wearing Nikes, had me wearing this. And after a while, it's just like, hey, man, why don't you just like have you wearing your own stuff? And it was my brother, Jason, who actually hit me to that, where he said, uh, you should stop putting Adidas and all that stuff on your shirts. And I said, why? He said, because that gives them free advertisement. They mm -hmm. should be paying you. To put that on their shirts. And I said, why would Diaz pay me to put that on a shirt? You know, I was like 19 at the time. And he said, because you're advertising them. And then I, so then I said, oh, then I finally got it. So then during the eighties, I started thinking, you know, if somebody comes in, that's what they want. I give them what they want. But for me, if I'm going to create something, I'll create characters that look like y'all, but they don't wear Nike. There is no Nike in their world. All their stuff is their stuff that they create. Matter of fact, this shirt right here, the brother in Philly made this for me. Culture <laughs> living. This is original. Creation. You know what I mean? So, and I like that. And I say, because we have creativity. Let's 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 make our own gear. Let's make our own. Let's imagine. Imagine if all the skyscrapers were ours. Imagine if all the boats that you see were ours. All the cars were ours. But see, it's it's hard for us to fathom that. But people in other countries, they live that. They don't have to create that type of mythology because it's their reality. Even in Africa, they could say, hey, that 
you know, Lagos, Nigeria. Oh yeah, th this is all us. But that's a different mind state. Black people in America, I think we're like the only people where it's like to to have that imagination. It's almost like unreal. Yeah. Almost like 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 we'll fight each other not to have that imagination. Oh, well, that, well, that goes against our history. I said, this is imagination. Don't you know everything in history? Somebody had an imagination and created it. Don't you know the griots and all of them told stories that were fantastic stories? Heru, Asar, Set. These were all fantastic stories that were mythologies that helped people to have principles and they lasted for thousands of years. They weren't based on, they weren't always based on something that actually happened. It was based on masterful storytelling that creates principle that helps people to live. They're, they become proverbs. So Brother Man was just, okay, here's this contemporary type mythology that will have proverbs. So, um, oh, now I forget what I was going to ask. So how how would you suggest, if, if, if a kid is watching this, how would you suggest them to learn to imagine what are some things that they can do um well first of all i would say like your imagination is yours and i think nowadays i it, it's hard for me to imagine being a child nowadays because we're bombarded with everybody else's ideas like we wake up to everybody's ideas. I mean, not to say, you know, when I was young, yeah, I woke up, like I said, Marvel Comics, Disney, everything that was going in my head was somebody else's idea. And then I got to find a way to filter all that and create my own thing. But you're never going to have original, original, because everything is going to be based on what our mind's eye has taken in since we came into this planet. You know, all the books that we read, the movies that we watch, everything is going to have some type of influence. But what I say for a child is if you have ideas and you think your are because sometimes we may have ideas, but we don't want to move on it because we say, well, nobody's into this. Everybody wants that. So then you're not really doing what you feel in your heart because you're concerned about what somebody else is going to think about what you're creating. It's like, oh, just go ahead and, you know, create what you're going to create. Now you got to own up to what you create, you know, whatever you create, everybody's not going to like it. That's the first thing you got to understand. Everybody's not going to be your fan, but are you creating it to satisfy everyone or are you creating it to, um, you know, I look at it like, you know, I'm a conduit to, you know, uh, my, my spiritual self, there's concepts that come in like, well, I don't really know where it comes from. I don't make it up. I'm just showing y'all what popped into my head. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I tell younger people, you know, if you have an idea, you know, throw it down, put it out there. Don't worry about what somebody else is thinking and um, and just let it evolve and, and continue to, to push what you're creating. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yes. How would you what what advice would you give to parents because a lot of times I think when you have like a creative child or something like I think I felt I fell into that trap because I didn't realize my child was a visual thinker and an art I didn't understand how when you're a visual um artist you think differently and you process differently so when you talk about like the comprehension things I get that because my daughter would visually put things together and I'm like that's how you remember things mm -hmm. but it's a different chain of of ways of remembering so like how what advice would you give to parents in terms of you know like working with art artistic kids um I think well parents in general I think they should um cultivate cultivate their children, allow them to grow. And I think, you know, sometimes, um, I'm trying to think of how to say this, because, you know, I raised two sons. I got one 31 and one 26. And the 31-year-old, he does special effects like for blockbuster movies. And the younger one, he's into um, like IT and real estate. So one went the real creative route the other one, he said, hey, I, I want to make money so then I can finance other things for the family. So they, ha they have different ways to think, but they also, they're very close knit. But I didn't tell either one that when they were growing up, hey, you got to do this or you got to do this. It's like whatever they want to do. I said, hey, 
What's it going to take to do that? What do you want to do to do that? Well, let's go get it. Let's find out what we need to go get it. And then what happens is that feeds their excitement and um, their dedication to their craft because you're investing into their craft and things that they they want to develop. See, I don't I don't fight against it and say, hey, you got to do what I'm doing, you know, or you got to do it the way that I did. You know, because my parents, they were educators and my dad was he was a researcher. My brother Guy is a creative writer. So Guy was saying how, you know, sometimes him and dad, him and my dad clashed because Guy said, I don't, he said, you know, I research, but dad's a, dad's a, a researcher. He doesn't write, he doesn't make stories up. I make stories up. And, and as far as my parents saying, okay, you know, you got to go to school, and this and that. And I felt like with what I wanted to do, I just wanted, I wanted to, um, be an entrepreneur and sell my art. You know, I didn't feel like school was going to save my life, you know, and that's not putting down like what my dad went through, but school literally saved him because he came up in a time where like, like, well, even like my mom said, people weren't going to school back then. And they're coming up in the projects in Jersey city where it's like, when he said he was going to college, people thought like he was going to Mars. All they knew was like college. Then what do you get out of college? Like, what do you get after that? You see what I'm saying? Like that was the mentality that he was up against that. So now he has that. So he'll emphasize to me, you got to do this. You got to do it this way. And I'm like, well, I want to draw. I want to do this. I want to create like this. But he, he didn't fight me on it. He did the same thing. He said, well, let's get you an art table. Let's get you the art supplies. And then my mom would create a space where I could sit down and draw. Mm -hmm. And I never felt like they made me be anything else. But then as I got older, the things that they were telling me, I respected it and I started to implement it into my art because I didn't, I didn't villainize it because I didn't look at it as the enemy. I just looked at it like, I just want to do something different. But I think if they were like beating it into me and, and I felt like basically abused by them, I'd probably not want to do anything that's related to them. So I would, my art would probably be far from whatever they were teaching because I didn't like them. Mm. So it's like you want to, and not to say you just got to be your child's friend and, you know, that either. I'm just saying, just listen to them. And and because a lot of times we can learn from the youth and they sometimes do things that we never thought of, like because they're living a different life and a different time. And then they could say, share things with us. They're like, man, I never would have thought of that. Because I always, my sons, they, they show me stuff all the time, but they respect what I say and I respect what they say. Um, but I don't feel like we pander to each other. It's like, we're really kind of growing with each other. And I, and I used to teach art classes to kids. And mm -hmm. when I had a, a store in Philly and other places, I mean, I've, I've mentored so many young people and a lot of them to this day, they say that they appreciate the way that I taught and the way that I talk to them and, and work with them. And I used to, you know, I never thought I, that was a skill set for me. I was just kind of dealing with them in a way where it's like I wanted them to, to achieve whatever it is that they're trying to achieve and not do it my way. Like find out your way of being the greatest of who you want to be. How do kids today have more access, right? Yeah, y'all were doing the brother man thing. Y'all hustled and like had transferability, like nobody's business. Like to think, I mean, because it was in the Afrocentric era. So when y'all was doing like the brother man thing, I mean, y'all hit like selling a product independently, like at the right time, like going to black expos and I mean that it was is genius, like genius the way like things lined up in a sense what do what about kids today I mean like with nfts and and you know monetizing you know like computer drawings and things, what are your thoughts about that oh I mean you know every every generation things are going to change um and evolve and um you adapt to the way things change and evolve and sometimes things align perfectly. Like for us, the Black Expo aligned perfectly. Like, so when people say, 
hey, I need to do like what y'all did. And I said, well, you really can't, you can't really do exactly what we did because what we did was just something that aligned in that point of time and we moved on it. So now just say like, like you were saying, the NFTs, then you have people that move on the NFTs now. And then what if one day they say, oh, NFTs aren't jumping anymore. People aren't making money like they used to. So the people that jumped on it at that time and they made the millions of dollars or whatever, somebody says, hey, man, I want to do what you did. Well, it's not like that now, but there's this now. You should jump on that. You know what I mean? And and like, uh, like uh, what's the other one? The uh, stock options when everybody's getting on the game stop stop op stock option and then all these people made money off it and then you come in late and i want to make the money off it it's all yeah it already passed yeah but it doesn't mean something else will come up it's like mm -hmm. different people they, they get in on something and it aligns perfectly and but you also have to put in the work it's not like it just aligned and some people just got it they still had to put in their work they had to learn the system they had to uh, have a plan and we had a plan of action and everything that we did prior to was a setup for that plan of action. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah, technology is going to change. It's going to keep changing, but that's why we keep thinking differently. But the thing that you have to have, you have to have a drive. You, you, you know, if you say, um, like my younger son, he wanted to get into the IT and the real estate. You don't just do it just to do it. He studies right. on his own time. He, he said, Hey, they call me Baba for father. They say, Baba, I just got the certifications for this. Yeah, I got I'm gonna get the certification for that. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but it <laughs> works. You know what I mean? But they'll put in the work. Mm. You know what I mean? And then I know other children who and young people who who are like uh uh great at what they're doing because they put in the hours and hours studying and, and reading and doing tutorials and things like that. And I feel like they're way more advanced. Um, than I was at their age because I didn't have that type of access that they had. And but I'm like, hey, that's great. We're all we're always supposed to do better than the previous generation. You know what I mean? And then y'all show the the next generation how to do it, and then that way they can come up and do it quicker and faster in terms of their success. Before I I, I talk about victory, Stan, do you think that with AI and stuff that it it's limiting creativity? Do you think that that, or is that just a part of the process? Um, I mean, it's to me, it's like pros and cons. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, I I'm not really big on how I see a lot of the technology going, but I'm like, well, what can I do about it? Because the thing I don't really like about a lot of the evolution of stuff is how it's being utilized. Like a lot of stuff's being utilized for hacking, scamming getting over on people, fooling people with the deep fakes and all that stuff. Like if it was if it was special effects for a movie to entertain people and tell great stories to um to open up people's consciousness, that's one thing. If it's another thing to say, hey, I'm a fake, I'm like I'm that person so I can get into their bank account. And then it's easier now. A lot of people they put their energy into these slick ways of getting over on people using this technology. And I, I don't like that. You know, it's just like, you know, now you got comments and everybody can comment on stuff, but it, a lot of people they they're losing people skills it's like okay you can comment but why you gotta like curse people out like you're 15 years old just because somebody doesn't agree with you can't you you have to learn how to have conversations with people that's critique if i don't like something the first thing we learned in school was how to say why you don't like it to help the person get better but mm -hmm. then you balance that with but i'll tell you what i do like about it Mm -hmm. you don't want to just say hey i just like it say yeah it'd be cool if you can do this 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 but hey the fact that you're doing this this and this that's great and then it, it helps the person to evolve mm -hmm. so um so all in all you know i think the ai is it's going to be there um and if it gets to a point where like ai is doing all the artwork and all the creative stuff yeah. somebody still has to program that then maybe you want to be a programmer and jump in on that so mm -hmm. but but Honestly, for me, if you ask me, I personally don't think with technology that it will ever replace the, a human in terms of like, like when I think of music and things like that, because um, because the, the fact that we have flaws, because when things get so perfect, it becomes artificial and you don't feel it. 
you know, like when music becomes so artificial, you know, I like when I like when somebody is messing up a little bit on the bass or you can hear the bass or if a DJ, he's cutting, but it messes up a little bit and brings it back on beat. I used to like that type of stuff because it's a human being. But now if everything's so perfect and precision, you know, it's, it starts to feel fake to me, you know, but, you know, I, I just say, I don't know, at a certain, <laughs> at a certain point, I just say, I know that's right. I, I just watch and see. That comes with age, right? <laughs> yeah, I say, hey, you know, what can so, I do? So you're in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. What does that feel like? It feels good. It feels real good. Um, it's like, uh, mm, let me see. I mean, in, one, in some ways, it's kind of surreal because you don't think of yourself, you know, because time goes by and just like, hey, I'm in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think a museum, I think of the Franklin Institute, <laughs> Ben Franklin, you know, uh, George Washington's shoes, uh, my shoes, why my shoes? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that, in, in that sense, it's kind of uh, funny. But then in the other sense, it's like, oh, man, this is cool because this is being archived, like, uh, you know, indefinitely for uh, younger people to see. And and then you know, I even had to like think about it. Like, you know, when I first archived some of my stuff at uh, Auburn Avenue Research Library here in Atlanta, then Clark Atlanta down here has the original pages, the brother man. And I had to make those decisions to say, eh, do I don't want I want to hold on to these pages. But the pages were kind of getting messed up, like me transporting them around and just over time they become acidic and then they store them and take better care of it. And then people have access to go see them because I was never thinking about selling them. Mm -hmm. I'd rather keep them together. So then when so then when the Smithsonian collected it up, uh, by that time I was like, oh, that's cool, man. You know, and then I focus on the new things I, I want to do. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, it's archived. It did what it did. And I'm thinking about new things I want to do. And, you know, say brother man, you know, when it becomes a movie or an animated uh, feature or whatever, you know, people will be rushed. They'll be rushing to the museum to see the originals. Yes. Is that going to happen anytime soon? Um, I mean, you never know. I don't say okay. I don't say yes or no, because, you know, the things I'm working on now, everything is aligning to that point. Just like when we we're talking about with the Black Expos, you know, um, the comic book came six years after I started airbrushing on the street. I'm just a kid airbrushing on the street. Next thing you know, Arsenio Hall's talking about me and my family uh, six years later. And then that goes to something else and then something else. And then I'm, you know, working at animation studios. So you, you never know. So, so after seeing the way my life has been going, uh, I, I believe it can happen soon. It doesn't, it doesn't have to take a long time. So you've done a lot of graphic novels. What do people misunderstand about your role in that process? Mm, I don't know if people, well, I don't know really what people would misunderstand. You know, I'd say, hey, I'm an illustrator, so they know I'll illustrate it. Mm -hmm. People may not understand maybe what it takes to do it because it's really like every book is like a year off my, well, I don't say off my life. It's a it's a year uh, of dedication to produce each one of those books, um, and that's the graphic novel ones. The children's book, like Becoming Muhammad Ali, those those are spot pages. So that was done in a couple months, but um, like crossover book, uh, becoming um, not becoming uh, Victory Stands, mm -hmm. and I'm currently working on Bad Boy, um, Life of Walter Dean Myers. So that those are all like at least a year worth of production. What do you um so like I want to talk about Victory Stand and this moment, the 1968 Olympics. Um what was your first thoughts when you were learning about this? Like what were when you first saw it, what was your impression of this moment? Oh, you mean the actual the actual this part, this oh, okay. the podium, this moment here. Well, that that to me, that image. Let's see, I was three years old because I was born in '65. Uh, so 
you know, I wasn't really conscious of it. Like when it, you first became aware of it, like when you yeah, saw I it. Yeah, aware of it. Like, my, you know, like I said, my dad, we had like the Black History Library in the basement. And that was one of the images that we had in the, in the home. And to me, looking at that, I always, and it's funny, like the author, Derek Barnes, mm -hmm. you know, because he, he's one who uh, brought me on to the project, mm -hmm. you know, respect to him for that. And he and I, when we were on the uh, the, the tour with uh, Dr. Tommy Smith uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we we both said the same thing. He said, yeah, when I was a kid and I used to look at that, I used to think, hey, did the Black, did the Black Panthers win the Olympics? He said, that's what he used to think. And I said, yo, I used to think the same thing, like, you know, because it was during that time, you know, the black gloves and that image was like powerful. So, and we, and nobody really knew his story. You just see that image. So that image was just like, oh man, that's like the ultimate black power, man. And they're on the Olympic stand, you know, you know, it's not, they're not scrubs. These guys are like, you know, and, and Tommy Smith was the fastest man, you know, yeah. fast in the world, still holding records. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So they 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 to they were like uh superheroes, real life superheroes, and then they're holding up the fist representing for us. Yeah. You know what I mean? So to me, it, it was very powerful. How did that so you have this vision of them and you you learned about this moment going through this project project? What new did you learn that you were just like, wow, this is you know, that added to what you already knew? Uh, oh, a whole lot. Because all I knew was the fist, him holding the fist up. Now I'm learning, you know, I learned his whole life. And I sat down with him and talked to him. Uh, you know, when I, I mean, we talk all the time now, but when I initially met him, um, I was just like, you know, because I read the script and then I went to ask him questions about his brothers and sisters, the home that he grew up in. Um, I wouldn't even have thought, like, I guess because when I think of the Olympic picture, I wouldn't have thought sharecropper. I wouldn't have thought um, poverty because I'm looking at the Olympics. You know, my mind is in like this, this uh, sphere of greatness and, you know, uh, access. You know what I'm saying? So when I when I started really learning his life story, I said, oh, man, this is like a story of triumph. That makes it even better, you know? So that actually was the thing that opened me up even more because everything in the story was new to me. Mm -hmm. Did you feel pressure like having to capture that moment or any, you know, or or his story at all? Did you feel what, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually more so than that moment was just when I first started, you know, cause I think, yeah, this is my first biopic. And the Walter Dean Myers one now is like my second one. The Muhammad Ali is different because Muhammad Ali is not here to say, hey man, you can draw me right. What well, ain't have you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But Tommy Smith, you know, I was like, oh man, what's he gonna say when I draw it? Did I draw it right? You know, I'm drawing his family. And, and I didn't have like a lot of reference right. because he didn't have a lot of reference, you know. And so when I was at his house, that's why I was asking him a lot of questions. He took me down to his his basement, which was like an archive, like a museum. Like uh, he had all these awards, the who's who or whoever. He's a picture of everybody with him. Um, and, you know, he showed me his medals and stuff like that. So before drawing, you know, you just think of like, this book is going to be a beast, man. Like all this work I got to do. And then that anytime I uh, <clears throat> approach a project, it, you, you feel that. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking him, uh, what his house looked like because I knew I had to draw his house when he was young. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I thought he was going to say, okay, yeah, here's a picture of my house. You know, here's what the inside looked like. You know, you got to get it right. Blah, blah. You know, I'm thinking he's going to be like that. He, he said, you know how to draw a shack? I said, yeah, I draw a shack. Said, that's my house. <laughs> he kind of chuckled and I said, and that's, a, <clears throat> that's his personality. He's really uh, laid back, really cool down to earth brother. You know, he's the, he's the elder. You know what I mean? And they say, hey, you family now, you know? So I felt good coming out of it. And I wanted to do my best to represent his family, like his father, his mother. Mm -hmm. and, and then I felt too drawing it. I just was drawing from 
like what I feel like from my family, not just my brothers and stuff, but the extended family, uh, family I don't know, but knowing that they came from Union, South Carolina, Statesboro, Georgia, and they came up to Jersey City, and then we ended up in Philly, you know, like that's a long journey, like what they go through, you know what I mean? It's like, so I feel like this is representing for all of us in that journey, like this is the opportunity for me to draw a story like that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tough topics in here. I mean, like in terms of lynching and um, images of, of that and the Klan and things like that. What do you think about as you're balancing that with a kid's book, you know, like to make it accessible without being traumatic, you know? Mm. Well, um, well, first of all, you know, like I'm when I'm drawing, <clears throat> I'm I'm following through with the authors. Mm -hmm. so Tommy Smith, he'll sit down and have conversation with Derek Barnes, <clears throat> and then Derek Barnes has a script. That script is approved by the publishers, and then so then when it's handed to me, it's not like I'm really creating what I want to create. I'm trying to create what the like collectively what's there i'm just adding to a visual appearance and um and i think that, and then something like that because you know there's that that one i think there's one there, yeah the the one spread with the clan <clears throat> excuse me and when i got the when i saw the the way it was written i said i see this mm -hmm. i see this and then and and to me i think like i said i think cinematic so I think of it like like if it was a movie, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have, you know, I didn't have. It wasn't like, hey, draw this, draw that. I said, mm -hmm. this is what I see. Because I remember when I was young, and my dad had this book called The Movement, and I used to be in the basement, and I was probably like fifth grade, <clears throat> and that book was, you know, basically like the civil rights movement, and it was like a lot of police brutality it had like. Uh, lynchings you know a lot of those famous lynching pictures that you see now and i think that was like the first time i saw like lynching pictures and i remember just being in the basement just going through the book and you had the bodies burned and all that stuff and people just smiling standing over it and i used to be like yo how can people be this devious you know and and at the same time it was like it 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 shakes that reality that this actually happened you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. to me, okay, I'm not going gory, but I'm going, re I'm, they got to see a, a piece of reality so they know, like, oh, this, because I think now KKK has been so popularized in media that people are desensitized to what it really meant. Mm -hmm. Oh man, KKK, man, the KKK was here. I do this, I do that. You know, and it's like, you know, or it's like, you don't know what you'd have done back then. Like it was a totally different, it was totally different terrain back then for our people. You know what I'm saying? But I think a lot of us, we look at look at things now because a lot of things have been um popularized and uh diluted. So to me, it's like, well, you know, I would show it to a point where, you know, I think kids can handle it, but mm -hmm. there's gotta be a certain type of uh, jarring moment. What do you think about do you think this will have you had any issues with this with the critical race theory and things like that because what i like about this book too was the the theme about sports and social justice so even and to the aspect of 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 standing alone you know like just there are times when that you know like are you brave enough to do that right mm -hmm. do you feel like um have y'all had any issues with this yet in terms of some of the content or anything mm -hmm. So far, no. <laughs> I'm shot, and it just goes to show you like what they don't read or don't have an understanding about in terms of critical race theory, because basically, I mean, this is talking about ideas of like in sports about like not letting them use you for your body, like in 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 the idea of boycotting, and if we did this as one, what kind of difference we could make? I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's really like radical, you know, like. It was it's radical thinking for us, you know, and it, and here it is in, in a graphic novel, which I I appreciate because um I think we we're so social media related and we put an image up and think that that's protest, 
you right, know right. Like that but it's like no look at what people were sacrificing and doing for progress and and he put everything on the line and you know he was just what reinstated in him and um John Carlos they were just reinstated I think in 2019 you know um but he had to endure all these losses all those years he said one time he got robbed they like he, you know his house just got robbed mm-hmm. they took a lot of his awards and stuff like that trophies you know and um then we met his new wife Delois um she really was instrumental in helping him you know uh re reorganize and and push to where they are now with what they're doing now mm-hmm. and to me I think all of that was cool because even that him meeting her it goes to show the value of a good partnership and them working together and then them still being because she's on the tour with us and we'd be having a good time and laughing and, and I like their personality and how they are and it's like man see we need to see more of this because there's a lot of like um uh things that are really destructive like to our families and um and sometimes it's like you just gotta hey if this this is what it is this is what you gotta do i mean what comes with like, like uh, bottom line is, and this was even in brother man number 10 the <laughs> one line brother man number 10 uh when the dad was protesting the units towers and uh one person said uh, aren't you afraid of what they're going to do when we go out? And he said, if we're afraid of what somebody's going to do before they even did it, then we might as well just quit. Like, you might as well just sit down and do nothing. Mm-hmm. You can't worry about what, whatever somebody's going to do, they're going to do anyway. What you got to do is do what you're going to do and represent what you're going to do. And that that's what this book represented. He 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 followed through and his the power... <clears throat> He was empowered by his family, his journey, um, knowing that he's standing there for all of those who couldn't stand there. And he he dropped his head, you know, he did the Lord's Prayer, you know, because that was his spiritual connection. Like basically, uh, yeah, everybody says, on God, on God. It's like, y'all be saying it, but do y'all really like, do y'all really understand like that terminology? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking from a Christian, so I'm just talking about spirituality like <clears throat> are you centered on something to the point where you say hey man i'm just gonna go ahead and do this but i might lose a lot from this but i gotta do it yeah you know i mean there's a lot of stuff we went through like when we were doing brother man in the early days <clears throat> um because we were doing something that went against the grain and it was going against uh mainstream industry you know Mm-hmm. And some people were saying, hey, man, you know, like, without Marvel and DC, like, you wasting your time. You know, we got kicked out of Toys R Us. You know, there's so much stuff that happened. And How did we get kicked out of Toys R Us? Please tell the story. Uh, I, that's, you probably need another hour. Okay. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, that was a whole other story. But, and I think it was tied into a lot of other things. But, you know, we even had people say, you know, what y'all doing, man? You're going up against the world's biggest toy store. They'll kill you, man. You know, and um, and I used to say, hey, man, anything can happen. Because, I I mean, I understood. I mean, Brother Man was never about a comic book to us. Like Our theme song, we have a theme track called Not Just a Comic Book. And that was our commercial that we actually ran. Mm-hmm. Uh, my cousin uh, put that together. And it was it was a dope beat and everything. And it was. It's big city comics, not just the comic book, because it was never about comics to us. Mm-hmm. It was about uh, consciousness versus apathy, mythology, creating something that have people shifting their thoughts. Like, wait a minute, I can do this, and now here it is. All these people, like, even I was meeting with Lauren Hill, and she said, I, "I was reading Brother Man before I even had my career as Lauren Hill." You know, she was reading all through high school. Sam Jackson. He, it was his favorite comic book. He had all 11 issues in plastic and wanted to do a movie deal. You know what I'm saying? Like um, all these rappers and artists, filmmakers and stuff that I've been meeting over the years. And I wouldn't think they know anything. You know, I'm just like this guy coming in or whatever. And they say, yo, you do brother, man. Yo, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know how many times I've heard that? But to me, that's the end result of what we went into this with. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But what if I say, eh, I don't know, man, like Marvel might get at me or such and that might shut me down. And then all these people would never have had that aspect of, of influence. And I'm not saying they never would have been great or whatever. I didn't make them. But all of us get, you know, like if it, think of all the people maybe that did get shut down who probably would have took us up even further if they were able to manifest what they created or weren't scared to put out what they created. They would have got they would have had all these other soldiers behind them saying, oh, man, that's possible. What? I never even thought like that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So to me, that's why we can't be like running around scared all the time. We got to say, hey, this, this is what I'm going to do, especially with creativity. Yes. How did hip hop influence what you do, what you do visually? What, how did that play a part of your visual art? Oh man, that was a big, that was a big part of my life because I came up right in the cusp of it. Like, uh, like I said, when I, when I burned my comic books and that was based on, uh, like I said, I had a big comic collection in the mid seventies. Like I started collecting in third grade and I think by the time I hit like sixth grade, I had like a thousand comics and, uh, and then my dad sat me down and talked to me about the uh, images in the comics. And see, back then, I used to like not eat lunch so I could save my lunch money and buy a couple comic books after school. And then eventually I got up to a thousand. And then so when my dad sat me down, you know, I was all hyped up. I'm thinking I'm going to put my dad onto the hypeness like, oh, my dad want to talk about comics. OK, let me put him on. But then, you know, when he started talking to me about like how many of these books had black characters, so I say I have a, a stack of books like this. Okay, this many. Okay, how many have aliens and whatever? It was really the rest. Now let's take the black characters and go in there and see how they're being represented in the books. And then that's what opened my mind up to like, man, this is what I'm supporting. You know what I mean? And it, it was like a lot of um, stereotyping or uh, sidekick type stuff. And then even my brother was saying, like, because, you know, Black Panther was cool that time, because this this is way before, you know, anybody was even talking Black Panther. And I remember my brother Guy said, hey, if if, uh, if Black Panther own, is the king of his own nation, why is he taking orders from Captain America? Why are he running around with the Avengers? Don't he have a country to run? And I was like, yeah, hey, what's up with that? You know, this is like in the 70s when we're talking about that. And you so know like how progressive that is, though, like. People are just now looking at children's literature that way, like what y'all had as little kids. Mm -hmm. Like we're just now looking at the way books are, the demographics of books, the way your dad was teaching you how to do as a little kid. He, he was on point. He was on point with a lot of stuff. And a lot of people don't know, like who, like a lot of people who my dad actually mentored, the people that he brought through at home, like Sonia uh, Sanchez and all them. I think God probably put you on to that. And it's like, uh, oh, Malay Fe Asante. I remember he came to our house with his son, you know. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Like I, I, I was, I was in that, in that mind state. So to me, when Victory Stand comes along, it's not like it's a shock to me. It's more like, oh man, I wish my dad was here so I could say, hey dad, I'm doing the book for Tommy Smith. You see what I'm saying? But my dad passed away in '96, and my mom in '94. So to me, I. It wasn't foreign to me. It was like, oh, this makes me think of like the the 70s, like when we were growing up. It's like I'm illust that's why to me, it, it, it was cool because when um I finally sat down and got Tommy Smith's uh feedback on it. And I said so I was wondering, like when he say he said, Man, I held that book in my hand and I cried. And he said, How did you brothers y'all y'all drew my y'all made my life? He saw like me and um Derek Barnes. He mm -hmm. said, how did y'all do that? And so I said, hey, from my perspective, I said, hey, man, your life was, was our life. So when I think about that, I think about my dad. I think about the type of men that came through my home. Like Tommy Smith would have been the type of person that would have came through our house. Because my dad brought through all types of uh, powerful people through the home. Dr. Lynn Jeffries. Actually, Dr. Lynn Jeffries, uh, he, he lent the drummers that came to my mom's funeral that that danced and and um bowed down and did the whole ceremony, the djembe drummers and dancers at my mom's funeral. Uh Dr. Len Jeffries did that for my dad as a baby. 
Uh, and, and, a lot of people that they my mom talk. some credit too because I remember the story too about how your mom was bringing comic books into the classroom oh yeah yeah she was doing that way back in the day like we're just doing that like realizing that that's a good way for kids to understand how to comprehend literature and like you had such an open creative like I mean y'all talked and everything you, all those things like from what I'm finding is like our things that we need that some of the pieces sometimes are missing. Y'all had the library at home. They supported y'all. You know, they allowed y'all to think and create and y'all had each other like talking about these things. Like that's unique. That's like rare. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But like seeing all this now, like it, it all makes sense about how how brother man came to be i mean you grew up in the hip hop era like when you said the parliament part i was like like aspects of your art like are extensions of that like you know in the best way like i love it you know but it's just like you came at a time and you had these experiences but it lends to the fact too of just being unique like be your unique self for wherever that is because your creativity that's what that's what that is like that's your creativity you know? yeah and then um and the to i was actually making a point when i said the uh burning the comics so basically after my dad hit me to the images him and my mom had the fire going one night and i came down with my comics and then my dad was hey, hey what you doing and i said and I don't, I don't want these anymore. He said, no, I didn't tell you, like, you don't have to do that. I just wanted you to be aware. And I said, I'm, aware. I'm just saying, I don't want them anymore. And he said, hey, it's up to you. And I just took the comics and I burned, I threw them in the fireplace. Because before that, I was everything Marvel. I had Captain America shirts. Mm -hmm. I said, I wanted to go to New York um, just so I could stand in front of where Marvel Comics was just to be there. I was a I was a member of FOM, F O O M, Friends of Old Marvel, where <laughs> it was a fan club and every month I'd get like an incredible hope button, you know, a Captain America like membership card or something like that. And if my mom says something bad about Marvel, I was like, Mom, you know, like take that back. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Marvel, Marvel. And she'd be like, get out of my face with that. <laughs> so they probably knew like Marvel got me. They taking my son. <laughs> so oh my, my god! Probably have have that. She probably said, "Hey, you need to sit down with that boy." And so then, they watched you burn that. That they watched you burn that. Yeah, I just stood there and I burned it. So and just a little bit now. Do you think, man, that was that was worth a lot of money? <laughs> like if I'd have kept those. <laughs> well, I mean, people say you know I never thought about that probably until maybe probably ten years ago. It was eight years ago. I was at somebody's house and and that story came up. And then one brother was saying, man, I wouldn't have done that. He said, man, you know how much them comics is worth? And I said, man, you know how much my mind is worth? Ooh. That's he, he ain't had no comeback to that. Because I was like, yo, I mean, so, so what? So what? What if it's worth $10,000? Yeah. And then, and then when I grow up, my only goal is to work at Marvel Comics and draw Wolverine. No, no diss to anybody that does that because there's a legitimate opportunity. You know, I work at production studios. I work on on um, different shows and things like that. It's great experience, but it's not my end all of of achievement in life. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That's it's like to me, I want to learn these things so then I can make them applicable to us so then we can have our great stories that can stand with them. And, yeah. and like I said, I don't encourage somebody else to do that. I just said that was my journey when I was younger. Thinking back, yeah, I would have kept them. And but I never would have known the value anyway. It's just like if I kept my toys, my toys would be yeah. valuable. Now, I didn't keep my toy, I didn't keep my bike. I, I grew up and grew past that. So that was you, such a grown it, man thing to do as a kid, though. Like that's that's so real because who has the fortitude to just make that break and say like i'm like affirming my my identity yeah, yeah. That's, that's how i felt but then here's the deal so like mm -hmm. i said this is around seventh grade and then my brother michael he was at howard university and he came back home with this record and it had a red label on the front and it said super rapping Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. And I was like, what's this? I said, it sounds like superheroes. He said, play this. And I was like, what? 
It was the first rap record I ever heard. I put that on, it blew my mind. So I was like wide open for it because I just got rid of the superheroes yeah. and I just got introduced to new superheroes that can rap. Yeah. So all that energy that went to Marvel now went to hip hop. Like, oh crap, this is so dope. Mm -hmm. You know, and then Lady B show started up. And then so going back and forth to Jersey City, I was listening to WHBI in Newark, Mr. Magic Show, uh, uh, Chuck Chill Out, Red Alert. Then I come back to Philly and bring cassettes from New York to Philly that my friends didn't have. So I was like, yo, you got it. They, everybody's like, yo, no, you got any? No. Well, back then it was David. You got any new tapes that your cousins hooked you up with? I said, yo, mm -hmm. check this out. So I had all these underground tapes, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rock and the Force MCs before they were the Force MDs. I had all the cassettes of them. And I had all that underground stuff, stuff you don't even hear now. So doing Brother Man, Brother Man came out of hip hop. It's not, that's why it's funny now. Some people say, oh, Dawu, they'll see the equipment. Uh, Dawu got turntables. I said, dude, I've been doing that since I was 14. Mm -hmm. I used to do house parties, all that stuff. Um, Your uh, hustle game is ridiculous, right? Because you had the airbrush thing, <laughs> like DJ and all this kind of stuff. Like that was the error. It's like I, because that's why I was telling people, like, oh man, like I just remember, like, just walking down Germantown Avenue with my friends, and you know, everybody had a basement, whatever. And you just walk by and you hear somebody cutting it up, like coming out of a little little window in the basement because we didn't have social media, we didn't. A lot of times it wasn't on the radio. You, you just had to live it. You had to go where it was. And we're walking down North Philly, whatever. And you just hear somebody in their basement cutting. And then we'll just be posted up, like, listening, like, oh, man. You oh, and, you know, Philly's a city of history. <laughs> so it's almost like everybody was cutting ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And we just sit by and like, yo, who is that down there? And then you just, and then somebody else drive by in their car and, Back then, usually when people were blasting music, it was their music. It was like them cutting up and they're blasting their tape because we had our own cassettes that we were blasting. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that when, when Brother Man, like creating Brother Man was like, I want to take all this stuff and create our own world and put it in a comic book. Because I remember we used to go to, uh, me and a friend of mine, we used to go to New York. We knew a lot of the gra graffiti writers in New York that were highlighted on those movies like Star Wars and um, the book Subway Art was by this guy, Henry Chalfant. We, we went to Henry's house. You wow. know, you know who we are. The, so the, a lot of the guys who had artwork in that book, which is like the Bible to graffiti mm -hmm. internationally, one of the guys, we took the book to him and gave it to him in, in the Bronx. You see what I'm saying? So I I was invested in that. I mean, we're going to like a um it was like a a art show. It was like a graffiti hip hop art show, and Blondie was there, Fab Five Freddy, the Rocksteady crew, um, because they all had like artwork up. And I, back then, you know, I was just David Sims dude walking around like, wow, man, these guys are superstars. Because it's like the mid '80s, so this is when New York City was like hot, like new, like. Hip hop was like real raw hip hop. It was like that. And so to me, it's all that energy that I was trying to translate into Brother Man, but I wanted to create this own world. Like, okay, it's a universe. But what I saw, to me, what I felt lacked in like the hip hop movies and stuff like that was dimension to family. Like hip hop didn't come out of a vacuum. Who is Grandmaster Flash family? How did he meet the Furious Five? How did they come up with the name Furious Five? Like, I would always think about stuff like that. But we would just go to the parties and dance and everybody talks about things on the this one level. And I'm like, yo, but they're people. They're people with brothers and sisters and they went certain places. They had certain experiences that made them this fantastic person. But those stories, what are those stories? Like, those stories are starting to come out now because now they're starting to... You know, they made that uh, Get Down movie and stuff like that. But that's what I was on back in like 79, 80. I was like, I want to see like depth of these people. So to Big City was going to be, Big City is our world. It's a representation of Black people in America, but it's not America. Mm -hmm. They have their own story where they come from. We were creating our, our own history. You know, they're at the bottom and the top. They're on the money. They're all the built, you know, all the buildings are by us. So 
that was something that was ground groundbreaking that I still have yet to see now. Yeah. And that, that's really done in that style. Yeah. You know, Who is the person that has run up on you that's like a celebrity that's like, yo, brother man was like everything. And you were just like, wow, this is crazy. A, a lot. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of celebrities. Yeah. But I hope you get to work with Thundercat one day because as much as he likes, you know, like anime and graphic stuff and his music with what you do, that would be incredible. That would be incredible. You, you never know. I mean, I've run to people. I don't think they know anything about me. And next thing you know, I find out that they, they've been collecting Brother Man and they say they were kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, snap. Okay. You know. Yeah. Um, uh yeah so that's what i'm saying like so now i think um understanding that journey and seeing the impact that that journey has made um when i recently did the book signing for victory stand and what i was saying on the panel was because you know people they may not know my background and stuff like that but i was just kind of briefly explaining to them i said well what i think of myself as is a um a visual revolutionary you know but not always like the way everybody thinks the visual revolutionary but sometimes it's through fun and action and cinematics but y'all don't really know what's underneath the layers of these reasons of why I'm doing what I'm doing and I said I like to take those powers and I I said I want to put those powers up behind Dr. Tommy Smith so then I can make him look the best possible way so then it looks like a feature film to make people really want to know more about his life <clears throat> so I'm just lending my powers to him to to help him stand tall because he's helped us and he's still here like I said so y'all can shake his hand y'all because y'all should tell everybody come come get that book and come meet him and talk to him because he's he sacrificed a lot because if you know it was for you or not you know if he's in your town, yo, get out there and, and meet him and shake his hand, you know? <clears throat> um, so that's what I was pretty much emphasizing. And, I, and, and like we were saying earlier, all that ties in. Like to me, I see how all that ties into my lifeline. Because we all don't do things, like I said, out of a vacuum. We, we all do things like we inspire each other. Yes. We're all part of each other. Y'all did an amazing, amazing job on this. I wish I had something like this as a kid because I didn't read books. I was one of, I'm one of the people who would have benefited from something like this. This would have been my gateway because I would have been into stuff like graphic novels a lot more. Can I ask you too, are you, you have, since you have this power that, you know, like this influence and things, do you ever, like you did drawing for the soul. Do you ever think like I could reach kids like this I could reach kids like in this medium you know to to be those like visual revolutionaries if you will and things like that well that's the whole point of what drawn from the soul was because mm -hmm. when drawn from the soul was interesting because I conceptualized that at the time I was working in New York when I first thought of the title and my sons they were little fellas I think Amari was just born and so he was like one or two. And Adosi was five. He's five years old. So he was like seven. And what I was explaining to them was, and they're little, but I'm saying to them, man, here's how you create. You can create a product and you that product can be embraced into the hearts and minds of people like forever. So let's make something up. And let's 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 do this as an example. So we're sitting around, and I say, you know, I was saying, okay, how about an art, art instructional video called "Drawing Drawing from the Soul"? Because at the time there was no black; it was the first black art instructional video. Um, I got highlighted on um, Tavis Smiley's show about that. So that's another historical thing a lot of people probably don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, because before that, we had Bob Ross. And there was another guy who used to come on Channel 12 who did caricatures and stuff. It was a white dude. I mean, they're good, but I just, I'd never seen like a black person teaching me how to draw, you know? And I, and so I always wanted to have my own art school, you know? And so when we were doing Brother Man, like say if we're in Chicago 
or LA and then parents will come up and say, hey, can you teach my baby how to draw? And I'm like, well, I live, at the time I was living in Dallas. And I said, well, I live in Dallas. I can't teach a baby from Dallas. <laughs> He's kind of far away. But I would still think about it. Like, how can I reach all those kids? Let's make an art instructional video. So that's when I said to my sons, hey, let's do um, drawing, drawing from the Soul. And then the idea from that evolved and I shot the video and the concept of drawing from the soul was um, us telling our story from the inside out, not outside in. You have a story to tell. Cause like you can think of all of these black kids that may go to art school and it might be different now, I don't know. But back in the day, you go to art school and you don't really feel like your story is being told. All you, Cause like when I was in school, everything was about the Italian Renaissance which was dope, but nobody nobody told me about how they were inspired by the African art. And we kind of just skipped over Africa. Mm -hmm. We didn't really talk about black artists in America. Everything kind of was rooted in that from my, from my experience. You see what I'm saying? And I didn't really feel like my self-expression was, um, I didn't really feel like my self-expression was really uh, I won't say somebody didn't want it. I didn't feel like it at the time because I was like the only brother in the class. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I said, we we have a different way that we learn, a different way that we um, do our thing. So then when I did Drawing from the Soul, I said, hey, I like beats. I like instrumentals and stuff like that. So me and my cousins, you know, we made our own, we had our own instrumentals and stuff like that. So I thought this was a cool way to get our music out too because it, it's, it's not being put out through the music industry. It's being put out through a product mm -hmm. and then we got orders through the public school system kids loved it bopping their heads to the music while they're drawing and it was live it was like see now when you go on instagram and all that everybody does that now they're drawing with music and beats playing it's it's commonplace now when we did that back in 99 nobody was doing that but they don't have your history like if you think about doing that again because like they don't have all the knowledge that you gain from being you know like from just creating from necessity and things like that well, do you think that you have something different to offer now well to me everybody has something different to offer like you know the people that are doing it now I mean I see a lot of great stuff I just I, I mean I just know my I know my place on the timeline but I also welcome seeing this happen because to me that was the whole purpose was to shift the paradigm so that becomes the norm. And that's not just Black people doing Like, everybody does it now. They draw with music and all that stuff. And, and they, they have their songs, things that they like that moves them. Because as artists, you know, we sit down, we listen to our music. So I thought, hey, it'd be cool to have music. And I, this is the type of music I want to have. Like, cool instrumentals. These, these beats are cold, you know. And people, they liked it. And it was drawn from the soul. It's like, and, it, and a lot of people... Kids who had it, it's funny because I mean, I think about it, but I'm running into adults now and say, hey, man, I learned how to draw from Drawing from the Soul. And then they even say how the whole title of Drawing from the Soul made them want to do their own thing and not get caught up in what other people are doing. And I said, that was a whole, whole purpose. Do you think that there's a, do you think that Black artists now are supported enough that that they don't need, I mean, do you know what I mean? Do you, is it that there's no space for this because there's Insta Instagram and things like that? Or do you still think it's hard for um, black artists to find community and things like that or no? No, I think that, I think there's room for everything, especially now with internet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think we're alone in certain things, but for everything, when I'm finding that everything we, love to do like even if we think we're the only person that loves it there's a whole community out there you just got to find them and with the internet you can find them if you want to put in the work to find them so there's a certain type of music you listen to there's a whole bunch of people that listen to that you just got to be able to find them and and connect to them we, I, I was doing my thing during a time where I feel like things were special in terms of like like hip-hop was special like if if if, if uh, Slick Rick came out with a song, it was like you're waiting, 
with your thing, with your cassette yep. to record. Are they going to play it? Because you don't know when it's going to come on. And it's like, oh, there's that song. Then you hit record. Mm -hmm. I get the commercials and everything. And yep. it's like, because it was special because you didn't, it wasn't everywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it wasn't like you just wake up in the morning and things are archived. WDAS is not archiving what they played yesterday. You just have to listen to it all day long to get the new smooth songs that came out. You know, uh, hip hop was special. Um, your friends, if they drew something that was unique and different, it blew your mind. And it's like, it, you go to bed thinking about the drawing that your friend did. Like, wow, man, how did he come up with that? I got to do something and in, 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 in top them. Mm -hmm. I got to top them. You know what I mean? And it's like, so that, it was like a certain like excitement of that era. Now it's almost like there's so much stuff, like a thousand channels, it's, it's unlimited content. Um, people look at stuff and be like, oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that five minutes ago, that's old. Everything's old so fast that you're not getting a chance to really absorb the creativity of the love that somebody puts into something. And um, you have access to people from all around the world and they're putting in their culture and their love and what they do, but you're not even getting a chance to really take time and absorb like what this person put in there mm. because it's so accessible to you now it's like oh yeah I saw that let me jump on to the next thing it's like yo yo did you see what that person just did yeah. you know what I'm saying so that's the only thing that kind of bothers me now but even with that there's still people that see that being special and will hold that up you know what I mean so it's 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 just crazy who's comic whose comics that are out now are um are you like um reading and, and appreciate um hmm. man well the thing is, it's funny because I have a lot of comics that like because I, I support a lot of comic creators like especially black independent like if I see they're doing a, a campaign or something I might buy it but to be honest, I'm going not going to lie. A lot of times I don't get to read them. Like when I was younger, I had all this time to do it. And, you know, like right now I'm a, a assistant director at uh, Lion Forge Studios. So we're working on an animated series now. So it's my directorial debut. Uh, work on a show called Iyanu, Child of Wonder. Yeah, so this is my first real like director's job. And so my time is maxed out. So but, after I do a full day on Iyanu, then I'm working on Bad Boy at night. Mm. I don't have time to like read anything because I'm also trying to write my memoir like on my life. And so I can write a little here and there. It's like, man, I don't even have time to do that. Mm -hmm. because the show got to get done and the books have to get done. So I, so I collect stuff. I, I do have a stack of, of books and a lot of them are cool. They, they look cool, but I, I don't know what the stories are yet because I didn't get a chance to read them. So I, I just collect them and build them up in the archive. Okay. So one last thing before we go, what is your advice to black boys and young black men about reading and literacy and visual and drawing and being an artist? Um, I say, you know, just read as much as you can. Uh, reading empowers you. Um, and it also gives you guidance, you know, and, and also things you might read something and it, it, you might want to challenge it. You know, but in order to challenge it, you have to get the source. You you have to go to the source of what somebody's saying, and then you 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 do your research, and then you can counter it. But it, it gets your mind working, you know. And that's another thing that keeps you youthful. You know, when people get older, it's like you want to keep reading. You want to keep the gears the gears moving in your head, and so that habit starts early. You want to, uh, you know, even if you're doing if you're doing music, then you know. You do your thing, but you also want to read up on the greats, the people before you. What was their story? What did they go through? And then you might find a lot of similarities and in, in inspiration. You know, so so the thing is, you know, I would just say always read, you know, and it, and sometimes I wouldn't say what people should read. And I'll leave it with this, because my dad did a lot of um lectures and speaking in front of people, engagements. He used to get like a lot of standing ovations and things like that. And I remember one time me and him were driving home after he did like this, this bomb speech, not bombing. I mean, like, right. oh, he dropped bombs. People was asking like, <laughs> David, knock yourselves. You know, so we're in the car, I come home. And I said, I said, dad, how do you, how do you do that? He said, do what? 
So like, how do you get like, how do you do this? How do you like move the crowd like that and and talk like the way you talk? He said, he said you got to read, Mister. I said, read what? You just got to <laughs> read, you know. Just you got to. He said, the more you read, then the more you know, and then when you speak, you're not trying to you're not trying to make something up because it's just there. It's like you're just you're just um, uh, speaking what you know. Mm. You know what I mean? So at the time when he said that, I, I just wasn't sure what he meant. But it's funny. I didn't. I think I really didn't understand until after he passed away. Because after he passed away, that's when I realized that my dad's not here anymore to like give me the answer for something. I got to find out myself. So that's when I did my name change. I had my name change. Um, I got into health and uh, holistic health. I started reading like Dick Gregory's book, Dr. Africa, Nutricide, Queen of Food. Um, uh, Dick, yeah, uh, just all these holistic, African holistic health. Like I, I was into it. Like I was reading books on the A train, going to work and when I was in New York and then just black history books um, and and all these different things on ancient Kemet and understanding the, the relationship to that and the origins of religions, how it all comes from Africa. But I'm learning it my, myself. It's not like my dad's telling me. I'm going straight to these sources, Tony Browder books and things like that. And before I wasn't reading, like my dad told me to read that. I'd be like, dad, I, I'm going to the movies. Or I'm, I'm drawing. But mm -hmm. since he wasn't there, it, it was like, mm -hmm. I just wanted to get this information and know these things. And then once I started knowing the things, it started connecting to my art as well. Yep. Yeah. And then when I talk to people, I understand the perspective, a greater perspective. Because I think I was kind of always on that anyway. Like, like I said, dudes in the in the community and they're talking all this, all the stuff like what they know. And I always try to expand their mind to like, yo, let's think about our ancestors and this and that. But I think that was from a symbiotic relationship with my father. But then when I got older, I started reading the information myself where I can take it another step further with my art, mm -hmm. you know? So that's why I tell younger people, you know, you don't learn everything overnight. It just comes through time and, and adapting uh, new information. Mm -hmm. And then that, that helps you to, to shape your own future and your own greatness. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time and, um, Victory Stand is amazing. It really is. I, I mean, I'm a former teacher. I would use this book in a heartbeat to talk about a lot of stuff from then, from the past till today. It's sad to say some of the themes are still happening today, but it's a great book um, to learn about um, courage mm -hmm. and perseverance. It really is. So I think, thank you for your work. I appreciate it so much. And thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Here we go. All right. You take care.